Welcome, duckies and dice fiends, to the Chaotic Holes and Prevents Table Talk Show. We're doing something just a little bit different today, which I'm real excited about because uh, David is officially running our stream today, y'all. David is in the producer seat. No pressure, David. I didn't just put you on the spot. Also, I don't know if you've seen it or not yet, but Kay has has included a um, just talking to one person, like just talking to Ed. Ooh, we sorely tempted to just to just start the stream and just be like, click. You're just looking at me, but <laughs> I didn't do that. I mean, you could. Hello, Rex. Welcome on in. Uh, did I didn't see it on Moxie's. Rex, did you see your, when you first spoke, did you all see your little welcome pop up? It might be misbehaving. And if so, we won't be able to fix it till after this stream, but I want to make sure it is fixed. So please let me know. Thank you so much for the resub, Rex. That is 13 months. Wow. Incredible. So appreciate you. Oh, yeah, I know why absolutely. this is having problems. I've, I've actually got streamer bot open as well. Um, so yes, there we go. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. Then I just didn't see it. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Kay, one of your co-hosts. Uh, you can find me here on Thursday playing the Pokemon because that is coming out tonight at midnight, apparently. Um, I've tried not to think about it too much, but you can also find me tomorrow over on Chalice playing, um, well, you can find me over on the Initiative Order playing Chalice, which is a homebrew horror game which I'm very excited about. But actually, I'm going to kick it over to David, who's got the more interesting streaming news here. David, who the heck is you and what the heck is we doing here? Hi, I'm David. You can find me, obviously, here on Tuesdays, but also this Friday I will be streaming uh, Telltale Games, um, The Expanse, um, and that's a sponsored stream. I'm very excited to... Uh, to be running my first uh, uh, sponsored stream. But also today we are doing the um, talkie show, um, a podcast with video because it's the future. It's not the radio anymore. You could actually see us at the same time since like the 50s. I forget when TV was first like invented and distributed to the masses talk show where every week we talk about TTRPG stuff, how to be a better player, how to be a better GM, how to be a better person, all with a focus on intersectionality and inclusivity so that everybody can have a good time. And we have a topic. We tried to tackle this last week. We had some issues, but today seems to be going well, seems to be going really well. So, we're going to talk about non-combat spells. Especially those that are maybe a little bit lower level, and how you can... Secret hints and tricks with them. Things that you can do that most people don't realize. Um, just really useful utility spells, like why should you stalk something that doesn't do damage? Oh, there's good reason. Uh, but also some really fun creative uses that we've seen from a couple people. So, David... You actually recommended this topic. You want to you start us? One out of every 30 topics is my idea. Um, but, uh, so, I, I especially wanted to focus on low-level spells for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the Baldur's Gate 3 devs, one of the people from Larian, famously said, listen, we're capping out at 12 because once you get past that, how do you design it? Like, how do you implement the wish spell in the game? Um, oh, and there's our third co-host. He's a fuzzy little terror today, y'all. He is neglected, and he wants you all to know that. Um, Moxie says, I can't tell you the amount of times I have set off traps with Mage Hand instead of walking through it. That is thinking. Hi, Jester. Welcome on in, Jester. Tempest Claret, Cleric help with the wind. Like, mm. and and ultimately, like, that's the thing. It's like, one, D&D, &D, other tabletop RPGs is more than just combat. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm running another home game so that Kay and I can test some things. Um, and uh, there was this discussion on, like, well, 
can I have like a 14 in this stat instead of a 13 in this stat so I can have a plus this instead of, and I'm like, none of that matters. And they're like, what, what? Of course it matters. Why? It doesn't matter because combat is not going to be the bulk or the most important or the most challenging aspect of the games that you will have with me. Um, Press to digitation to clean up. Mm. And uh, it's and it's important to realize that as a caster, whether you are sorcerer, uh, warlock, wizard, cleric, druid, if you just stack up attack spells in my games, you're going to find yourself severely hampered. Both from like a... What's the... What's the word that I'm looking for? I don't know. Give me some some Not additional things. But like 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 from a a, a game mechanic standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um but also from a role playing and like story standpoint. Yes. Um, I was going to say, you know, Rex says their bard uses press digitation to clean the whole time. David was David and I are in a home game together now. David barged into my home game, which yes. I would be offended about, except I find it so much fun to play with David. Um, and together we are terrors. And I'm so sorry, Stephanie. Um, we are if you've seen Better Call Saul, we discovered that you put David and I in a game together and we are Saul and what's her name from Better Call Saul. Like, we're fine on our own. Together, we're toxic. We are poisoned. Right. Yeah, like, we've heard stories of Kinley, and I've played with Kinley. When Kinley shows up, Kinley is a terror to everyone. Kinley Including himself. Shakes, shakes everything up. And then I, I showed up with my character, who has his own agenda and things that, that he wants to do, except I it just kind of naturally drifted into, oh, this is the button I'm going to push. That button, that button is named Kinley. Mm -hmm. um, but we went through this whole thing where, and we'll come back to this story, because another spell on our list we're going to bring up. Um, but Kinley got drenched in swamp water. And all he wanted was to be clean because he's a very prissy little himbo. And he just wanted to not be covered in swamp water. And no one had prestidigitation. And we kept meeting NPCs. And Kenley's like, do you have any spells that can make me less gross? And no one did. And so we finally found an inn that had a bath. And Kenley spent way too long in a bath. I'm, I'm sad that, I, that my character is not a caster. Because the number of spells that could terrorize Kenley. But speaking of utility of spells, um, yes. Tiny Hut. Oh, Tiny um, Hut. We were doing a thing. Um, I was zoned out because I was focused on ways to continue to torment Kay, and I wasn't hearing things that people were saying because it takes a lot of brain power to torment Kay. Um, I don't make it easy. And then we okay. got into, uh, was it an, it was an actual fight, wasn't it? Yeah. So um, for those, of, for those of you who have played the, this, we were playing the Wild Man and the Witch Light by the book. So early on, when you first join, there's a group of bandits. When you first get past the carnival, there's a group of bandits. You know, hey, Ribbonanza, welcome on in. You know exactly where that is if you are familiar with the story. And Kinley was separated from the whole group. Kinley took a swan dive through the portal into the Feywild because Kinley loves the Feywild. Missed where everyone else landed and um, was was at the bottom of a ravine away from everyone. And a bunch of bandits came up and were, uh, you know, being bandits. Bandit. Yeah. And Kinley is talking a lot, as Kinley does, and gesticulating more than normal. And I'm, like, telling the GM that I'm doing this. The GM's like, okay, yeah. And um, I'm like, all right, we've been talking for about a minute. The GM's like, yeah. I'm like, cool. Leland's tiny hut is now around me. Um, and so for, for those who do not know, tiny hut is a third level evocation ritual. It takes one minute to cast. Um, Range self, 10 foot radius hemisphere. Huh, so that means so, it goes up, but not down. I wonder if you yes. have, it, okay. Um, it's not a bubble, it's a, it's a dome. 
It's a dome. Um, and it's a 10-foot radius of immobile dome of force springs into existence ab around and above you and remains stationary for the duration. The spell ends if you leave its area. Nine creatures of medium size or smaller can fit inside the dome with you. The spell fails if its area includes a larger creature or more than nine creatures. Creatures and objects within the dome when you cast a spell can move through it freely. All other creatures and objects are barred from passing through it. Spells and other magical effects can't extend through the dome or be cast through it. The atmosphere inside the space is comfortable and dry regardless of the weather outside. Until the spell ends, you can command the interior to become dimly lit or dark. The dome is opaque from the outside of any color you choose, but is transparent from the inside. So, all of a sudden, bandits can't get to me, and I have plenty of time for my comrades to come and save me, which Kinley's accidental, maybe, boyfriend did, went racing down the ravine to try and save him from the bandits. Um, the sorcerer, however, just said, Ah! Cool! What's the... Uh, it's not... Whirlpool, it's just wave. Tidal wave. Tidal yeah, wave. Tidal wave. So um, the poor t paladin who rushed down to try and save Kinley got drenched. And Kinley was nice and dry because spell effects don't pass through the hut. Ruling question on that. Since it's a half dome, can enemies dig underneath it? Um, this has been... I also was in a game where... And hi, Matt. Where um, people were... I think they recently clarified that it's a dome, not a circle. Because people were like, what if uh, we cast it and then it's got a bubble of like, what if we stand on top, like if we have someone up in the air and they cast it, does it catch the snow underneath? To which the answer was, it does not. And I don't know, I'm a mean GM and I would say someone can absolutely dig underneath it. I'm, I'm giving it a quick reread because that is a very interesting. Mm hmm. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, creatures and objects within the dome when you cast the spell can move through it freely. So, I would rule that yes, you can dig under it. You can't push through it, but you can dig under it. There's also been a lot of debate about um, friends and creature can pass through it. Like, friendlies can pass through it. If the caster passes through it, it stops. How much the caster has to pass through it, right? So can the caster walk to the edge of the dome, put a hand out, cast a spell, and bring hand back in? Depends on the spell. Um, and the reason um, I say so. It was also, um, can the caster, like, if there's snow on top of it, like, if you get buried under the snow, can the caster stick their head out, clear snow, and look around? So, I'd so, so first, um, it does specify dome, but not has half sphere, but dome, a dome is a dome. A dome is a dome. Is a dome. Right. And so, like, whether dome or half sphere. So, like, dome, if not by definition, I'd have to look it up, then at least by very strong implication indicates that it is upright. That it is that, that the 180 degrees is level with the ground and everything above that. Um, whereas, like, if you did, like, a, a, a hemisphere or a half sphere, then you could, in theory, cast it rotationally and thus making it a shield or a boat or whatever but yes you can dig under it however objects inside can pass outside but not not vice versa right so if you want to try to dig under a dome while whoever's in the dome can shoot whatever they want at you by all means well and again the um the person who cast it can stay inside and everyone else can run out and stab you as well. Uh, um, Ribbonanza says... Oh, yep, don't read it. Ribbonanza says, I would say no if the spell has somatic components, but yes on the snow. Right, so that so when it comes to like sticking apart, so like how how 
whether you can like stick a part out. I'd say the spell ends when you completely exit. Right. So if you stick your hand out, if you stick a head out, that's fine. Um. <laughs> the Houston Astrodome is not a hemisphere. But look, that's also Houston. Right. And as a Texan, I have opinions about Houston. As someone who's been to Houston, I have opinions about Houston. <laughs> Matt says, uh, if people could see you and shoot you, it was more like creatures with a dig speed. Yeah. You, you're going to be, you're, you're going to have a hard time. Yeah. You get a half dome. You don't get a, you know, you're not in a pocket dimension. Um, it doesn't say anything about a floor. So there are three components to spell casting. Uh, 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 vocal, somatic, and material. Good and luck to your sister. This is a great time to be from Houston. Why is this a good time to be from Houston? Because it's too hot to be in Houston. Right. Yeah, that that was one of my big complaints about Houston is is having been to 126 for a week straight multiple times. And having humidity. been to 117 degrees the whole time I was there like a couple of weeks ago the worst weather i've ever experienced was in houston <laughs> i was there for a weekend it was like 96 yep. degrees and like 170 percent humidity they um somatic is using your hands verbal is using verb and material is when you have to have an item to cast it Right. Um, so uh, for Tiny Hut, you need what? Uh, pearl? Verbal and somatic. I'm oh, sorry. No, uh, for Tiny Hut, you do need something else. I had a different spell up that we're going to talk about next. We just got really hung up on Tiny Hut. Um, yeah, but uh, it, uh, Tiny Hut requires all three, uh, verbal, somatic, uh, which is why if you cast silence on someone, mm -hmm. they could still cast. A small crystal bead. Um, and if you tie a sorcerer or like a caster's hands, they could still cast. Um, so I'd argue that if the, the barrier of the tiny hut separates one component from another, then you can't cast. So if you need all three and your head is inside, but you're holding the material and you're doing the somatic thing out, then the spell doesn't work to finish that thought before I went um, down this whole rabbit hole about how much I hate Houston. Anyway. And <laughs> one of the most <laughs> Rex y'all. Do centaurs we need, fall, we need to have a centaur we need to have a centaur counter. I need to rig up the death counter to have a centaur counter so we can see how many times the show across Size medium, you could have nine of them. Can't you can have it, nine will be, centaurs. it will be really tight. It will be very cramped. Um, but one of the most infamous uses of Tiny Hut was in Critical Role Campaign 2. I think it was Campaign 2. Pretty sure it was Campaign 2. They had to go, they had to go get a thing from an Elder Dragon's lair. They had to go into the lair of a white Elder Dragon. And um, steal from the Horde of an elder dragon not recommended if you want to live okay right. let me just be very clear and so they were trying to hatch the whole plan and what are we going to do hey welcome on in developer damien uh the question is less how many will fit and how many will want to squeeze in at that size i mean well if you're taking on an elder dragon um might want to fit all of them in the answer to that question is if i'm in the tiny hut at least eight of them <laughs> um and so the group threw down Tiny Hut and Caleb stayed inside the Tiny Hut. The one who cast it did not leave it. And then they went up and stole from the dragon and retreated to the Tiny Hut. While the caster inside the hut put down a teleportation sigil. Oh, so cool. they're just cowering as this dragon is attacking the hut, breathing uh, dragon breath on them, clawing at them, trying to get to them, can't get through the tiny hut, and the cast just like, teleportation, we're out! And they teleported out of there. One of the best uses of tiny hut. So I would just use tiny hut when I didn't feel I'd be in bother with people. Just be like, voop. Yeah. For the next eight um, hours, you're leaving me alone. Kenley will remember that if Kesla ever gets a little too Casting. pushy. 
about oh, those oh. teeth. Well, now I need to buy a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> so the next spell that I want to talk about, because this is one I really enjoy. Actually, we're not going to do this one yet. We're going to do a different one first. Um, because both relate both relate because um, I learned the ins and outs of both these spells because the same GM in a completely different game in a Ravnica setting allowed me to homebrew a species and I have a vegetation genasi. I have a very creepy 2,000 plus year old plant person who bleeds sap but is a grave domain cleric so needs blood so keeps borrowing the party's blood without their knowledge or permission. Oof. Woof. Yeah. I thought that might be what happened. Uh, Critical World Mighty 9. Glad I was right. So this was from way early. This was not in one of the recent ones. What? Kay playing a creepy thing? Right. It's very much the same voice as for Kai. Um, but I got two spells and we're going to talk about both. One is Druidcraft, but the one we're going to talk about is Speak with Plants because everyone's like, Speak with Animals. That makes sense. Speak with Plants. Now, Speak with Plants is a third level transportation spell. Um, you can talk to plants within 30 feet of you and it lasts for 10 minutes. I'm going to argue that this is one of the most underrated spells in 5e. Now, I'm going to read you the description. It's very basic. Uh, you imbue plants uh, within 30 feet of you with a limited sense of sentience and animation, giving them the ability to communicate with you and follow your simple commands. You can question plants about events in the spell's area within the past day, gaining information about creatures who have passed weather and other circumstances. Okay, fine. Plants are not horribly intelligent. Only 24 hours. You're probably going to get more use out of Speak with Animals, right? Hold up. It gets better. Keep in mind, this spell lasts for 10 minutes. So if you think a combat is about to happen, you can cast Speak with Plants before it begins. Because remember, combat happens really, really fast. It's the slowest part of 5e, but it happens really, really fast. This is where it gets useful. You can also turn difficult terrain caused by plant growth, such as thickets and undergrowth, into ordinary terrain that lasts for the duration. Or you can turn ordinary terrain where plants are present into difficult terrain that lasts for the duration, causing vines and branches to hinder pursuers, for example. So what you're saying is you can take your regular 5e D&D game and stick it behind a paywall because now it is a tentacle hentai. Look, most, I don't want to say we all, most of us have seen Evil Dead. Yeah. 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 Um, Ooh. yeah. Ooh. Uh, if you cast Speak with Plants and someone casts Speak with Dead on you, can you talk to furniture? As as GM, I would, I would definitely, yeah, yeah. 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 Like that's, yes, that is the kind of chaos that we like here. Um, it also, plants might that be able you to could perform. Get a chair to tie somebody to the chair for 10 minutes. It's like, chair, wake up, grab this guy. Plants might be able to perform other tasks on your behalf at the GM's discretion. The spell doesn't enable plants to uproot themselves and move about, but they can freely move branches, tendrils, and stalks. If a plant creature is in the area, you can communicate with it as if you shared a common language, but you gain no magical ability to influence it. This spell can cause plants created by the Entangle spell to release a restrained creature. Yes, <laughs> that's too fun narratively to deny. Exactly. If someone does something like this, it's like, yes, this is what I want. I did not plan for this, but guess what? Buckle up, we're talking to a chair. So when people are, why, why, did, why did you stalk, speak with plants? Because we're on the run in a wooded area. And if they catch us, I can make 30 feet of difficult terrain around yep. us, in front of us. Yeah, just, just yeah, that's going to give us a nice advantage in fight. 
Uh, the chair just starts telling you about how sloppy the region is and how often they drop food on their chair. Uh, That's fine. According to this, you can only remember the past 24 hours. But, yeah. Also, when you, pa when you cast Speak with Plants and Speak with Dead on a chair and it doesn't reply, run because it's a mimic. Fair. Super fair. So, that, that, that's... We need a centaur emote. That's what this <laughs> channel needs, is a centaur emote. Um, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at the mimic because, like... I haven't had a character in a game that I've played run into a mimic... But the second that happens, that person will never trust anything ever again. Yeah, um, I, we ran it once on stream. It's on our YouTube channel, which by the way, y'all check out our YouTube channel. Um, we ran, and I need to run it again. We ran a, um, a one shot called The Job which I actually was inspired by Liam's um, second one shot that he ran for Critical Role. And we're working on pulling, doing it again as a two-parter. You might see some recurring faces. Um, and there's, there are more than one instances of mimics hanging out in that. And the party gets so paranoid so fast. <laughs> You have to be real sparing with mimics and traps. Unless, like, in this, so the whole point of this is it's um, four rogues and a sorcerer breaking in to the house of the m the most powerful sorcerer in the city. So, yeah, there's lots of traps and things. Like, paranoia is part of it. There's going to be some tomfoolery. Yes. Uh, David, what's the next spell on your list? Also, there's this... There's there's this apocryphal tale. No, somebody somebody wrote like a short story or a blurb or something about the mimic that went home with an adventurer, and the adventurer um, like took really good care of it, and then the adventurer took made a bar, and then the mimic was like, "Well, I'll just be a chair," and then the mimic had kids. The tavern mimic. And so. Everything in the place was a mimic. And then a bar fight started. And somebody went for the old adventurer slash tavern keeper. And the mimics were like, him? Y'all can fight each other, but him? Mm. There is a really, really cool story about mimics that I read somewhere. It is lost somewhere on a Reddit thread that I would love to share at this moment, except... The concept of it is very, very central to something David and I are writing. So we can't. I can't. I mean, I can, but I'm not gonna because I don't want to give... Some of y'all hanging out in this chat here are a little bit too... Um, what's the word? Um, you're a little bit too good at guessing what the heck I'm up to. So I'm not giving you any more hints for this, this thing that's coming. David, what's your next one? My next spell is Knock. A spell that... Despite the fact that I have seen countless casters and only a handful of rogues, I've never seen in an actual play used and cast on something. Now, have all of these people run into things that were locked that they... So, knock. Choose an object that you could see within range. That object could be a door, a box, a chest, a set of manacles, a padlock, or another object that contains a mundane or magical means that prevents access. A target that is held shut by a mundane lock or that is struck or barred becomes unlocked or stuck or barred, becomes unlocked, unstuck, or unbarred. If the object has multiple locks, only one of them is unlocked. If you choose a target that is held shut with an arcane lock, with, that, with arcane lock that spell is suppressed for 10 minutes during which time the target can be opened and shut normally when the when you cast the spell a loud knock 
audible from as far away as 300 feet emanates from the target object. Now... Well, I've got some fun stories about this one, but you do your thing first. So, here's the thing. We've all come across a chest that was locked, a door that was locked. Um, there's always been, there's something that you need to take it with you. Too many people see like a little lockbox and the rogue is sitting there trying to and so, put it in your bag, take it with you. And then yep. when you get 300 feet away from, from civilized society, because uh, uh, Mimics and Misfits says the audibility is what gets me. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. that's... Now, the, Without... the spell isn't clear about whether it's loud enough that you can hear it 300 feet away, or if it's just magically you hear a normal volume knock within 300 mm. feet. That's a good question. I will say... David, I'm, I'm going to say this, and people who know, know and can draw the conclusions. We've certainly been dropping hints. Uh, David and I are running a game where there is a haunted house and a group of people come up against a door that is locked. And one of the magicians, one of the magic users is like, anyone pack a knock spell? And I'm like, oh no. Please use a knock spell in this house. Everything, Everything will come for you. <laughs> please use a knock spell in the haunted house. In right. the literal haunted house. Oh, yes, please. GM will have so much fun. I hope you all don't die. <laughs> da da GM will have will have so much fun. David will have to scramble for every stat block, for that everything ev yes. that we have tucked away in that place. K will go immediately gray from trying to run 64 monsters <laughs> in the same combat. I love a haunted house so much. I yeah, David knows I was gonna make a little thing and it got a little out of control and we ended up with a whole haunted house. Um But yes, uh Ribbonanza says knock is very useful <laughs> in Baldur's Gate 3, and Moxie Blue says I love knock. I got to use it for a cabinet puzzle with potions, and it was the best. But yes, uh also, one of my favorite stories about Knock was there was a streamed game for something, and I don't exactly remember what it was. Um, it, w it wasn't Demi Plane, but there was a, a, a game run with, with Abria and B Dave and a bunch of other people. Um, um, Whittle's player, I can't remember Whittle's player, not the Opera Geek? Was it Opera? I don't know. Todd Kendrick and his partner. Anyhow. And someone had a chest that they couldn't open. And the the rogue had tried to pick the lock and couldn't. And someone else had tried to, to open it and couldn't. And they finally got mad. Like, they, they picked up... They did what you said. They picked up the chest. They brought it away. They're back in town. And Abria's character's like, put it down. I use knock. It doesn't open. And they're like... So they pick it up and they bring it to an antiques dealer. Right, a person who deals in magical artifacts, and the person who deals in magical artifacts is like, that's a mimic. All roads lead to mimics today, y'all. Mm -hmm. And and the, the the critical role folk famously ran into a door they could not get in. <laughs> They've run anybody. into multiple doors. They could. They lost hit points trying to get into a door. <laughs> and if any of them, any of them had the knock spell on, on deck, they would not be defeated by a locked door. By an unlocked door. No, they were locked doors. But also, they were sneaking around, so knock would have undone. That's the I problem think, with knock. I think one day I will, I will run just the... Yes, Legends of the Multiverse Spelljammer campaign. Brennan Lee Mulligan was the GM. Thank you. Does knock have a have a verbal component. Well, since I have the handy dandy thing open, it is only verbal. Could you, could you have someone else cast silence immediately as you cast knock? 
and here's okay so like for, and first thank I'm you Rex up silence. Two, f- <laughs> second I don't know if there's like an official ruling in in the the actual like official literature but as a GM I'm not gonna say that you have to say the spell loud that you have to project like you could church whisper whisper that thing and it's gonna go off um you had okay it's so silence only has a 20 foot radius yeah in pathfinder 2e there are rules about your casting is big and loud pathfinder and starfinder both sorry continue um so uh uh Ah, so you do oh, Pathfinder. I need to take a closer look and, and find some way, some some wiggle room for that. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's only twenty feet. So a th- so is that a three hundred? Let me let me click on the thing again. Is that a three hundred foot radius? Why is this over here? Closest. Mm. Uh, because if it's a radius, that's a 600 foot diameter, which means okay, knock range 60 feet. No, it's a 300 foot, yeah, that's a 300 foot radius. That is enormous, yeah, that is a big area. So, if you paired. If you did a knock with a subtle spell and then cast uh, cast silence and then do a knock with a subtle spell. Yeah, but if you cast silence, then the spell doesn't go off. But with a subtle spell, oh. you can cast a spell without verbal or somatic components. Yeah. You can cast spells without others being... Uh... When you cast okay, a spell, so... you can increase the spell level by one to cast it without any somatic or verbal components. Yeah. So you could just literally walk up to the door and go, and with the subtle, with the silence. Off it goes. Off it goes. <laughs> See. <clears throat> this is what happens when you put David and I together. Right. This is why we are not allowed in games together. <laughs> Do you just yell the door open? I mean, isn't that what uh, Gandalf did to the Mines of Moria? Like, he read the thing and it's like, speak for it and, ev- and enter. And so he just walked up to it and he was like, Brendo. And then the door's open. So, okay. Matt says the verbal component is how you cast the spell. The knock is an effect of the spell. But silence also impacts the effect of spells, doesn't it? Yes. So that would, but but that would only be in a twenty foot radius. So there'd so be a twenty be... foot circle. No, there'd be a forty foot diameter circle inside the three, the six hundred foot diameter circle, and in that forty foot circle, you wouldn't hear anything. But outside of it, it'd be a bull. It, it'd be a bullseye. It's concentric circle. That's it. Yeah, that's incredibly perfect and confusing because no one would go to the center of it because everyone would hear the sound emanating yep. from that ring. So everyone would go to the middle while you're in the. Yeah, it, then, yeah, I it, like this. And and also like, knock doesn't say that it comes from a direction. It just says mm. you hear a knock. Yeah. So you you don't necessarily and and that's why, like, it's important to figure out if it's. Um, if it's like a really loud sound that everybody within 300 or if it's just a magic like you hear a knocking in your in your ear yeah because if it's a really loud sound and then you have that cone of silence then I found it um, then you then no one would know where was happening if the object can be the target of the spell silence, you can cast knock from 60 feet away. So the target object will then not make any noise. There are so many ways we can manipulate and break this. Right. Like it's amazing. Dear, dear wizards of the coast. We're going to need a closer 
<laughs> legalistic read on uh, the knock spell but because because it's written so like like on the one hand i would love more specificity just because i'm that guy um but conversely it's good that it's kind of written really loosey-goosey because we and it would completely shut the game down and we would just be like lawyering this yes but a table full of five people could successfully be like all right listen here's what we do we're gonna we're gonna put the silence on this thing 60 feet away got the 20 foot code of silence gonna hit it with the knock and because everybody hears a knock but they don't know but it's not loud it's not directional it's just you, in your ear you hear knock 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 and then you're like whoop well somebody's shit's getting jacked then someone's pockets is getting run right now then did you could you could Except the people in the 40 foot circle around wouldn't, or 20 foot radius, wouldn't be able to hear. And so they wouldn't know that the pockets was getting run. And then, you know, you could gaffle the thing, get out of there before anybody. And, and which brings me to another point that's very important that I think people who play TTRPGs dramatically uh, underestimate. And that is the the importance and effectiveness of a big enough distraction because mm. like how many times have people see like like a siege a castle or tried to storm the gates or tried to break it and they're like we have to sneak in without making a sound and then you've got somebody standing there with full plate and a shield going i am just gonna i'm just gonna sneak in here not make one single noise it's like no let that person go set off explosives somewhere else. Yes. So that everybody goes, huh? What was that noise? Exactly. And all the, the, the Metal Gear Solid soldiers turn in that direction with the yellow thing above their head, and then you could just walk behind them and do whatever you got to do. I, speaking of sounds, I'm going to bring us on to my, my second spell, which, again, is from my creepy plant person. Which doesn't do what everyone think it does, thinks it does, but does some other really cool stuff. David, we need to talk about Druidcraft. So Druidcraft is a cantrip. Verbal and somatic components, instantaneous. Druids get it. My creepy plant person gets it innately because they are made of plant. Whispering to the spirits of nature, you can create one of the following effects within range. Now, the one everyone tries to do, and the one everyone does, which is not correct, which I do just for flavor, uh, but, you know, the GM shuts down when someone is like, oh, well, we'll take this, and it specifically says, you can instantly make a flower blossom, a seed pod open, or a leaf bud bloom. You can't just make a plant grow and appear. You've got to already have a thing. So everyone's like, oh, I touched the ground, and suddenly flowers bloom, and it's like, cool, we're in the desert. There's no wildflower seeds here. That's not going to happen. Um, my creepy plant person makes flowers grow out of their skin because they're made of plant. Um, our group's rogue decided, awesome, can you grow cannabis? And was going to go um, make a fortune selling the gotcha. plant person weed. Uh, regardless of if it was effective or not, because we all started like half jokingly, like, does this? And I'm like, I don't think my character has the chemical components to actually make a cannabinoid work. He's like, I don't care if it works. I just want to sell it. Can you just make it look like it and I'll just sell it? Um, but that's the one everyone uses it for. It's not the coolest one. You can create a tiny, harmless sensory effect that predicts what the weather will be at your location for the next 24 hours. This might manifest as a golden orb for clear eyes or a cloud for rain or falling snowflakes. Uh, this effect persists for one hour. So you can use it to predict the weather a little bit, which is nice also, you know, if your GM is planning something that can be a cool thing. Um, you can instantaneously light or snuff out a candle, torch, or small campfire. It's not the coolest. You ready for the coolest? You can create an instantaneous, 
harmless sensory effect, such as falling leaves, a puff of wind, the sound of a small animal, or the faint odor of skunk. The effect must fit in a five-foot cube. So you can make a lion roar within 30 feet of you. You can... Have y'all ever heard a fox scream? Sounds like a human screaming. You can use druid craft to create a hell of a distraction and also stink up the room. It's a yeah, cantrip. If, you can spam it a lot. If it suddenly smells like a wild griffin in a room, you're going to be out of there. But so here's the thing. Um, Parrots and other types of birds can mimic human voices. So does that mean that you can have a parrot mimicking a human voice in a particular way, saying a particular thing? I would... As a, as a GM, I would say, like, yes, if it definitely sounds like a parrot right? Like, it's going to be like, rock, body, wanna, rock, rock, rock. right? It's not going to be your, even though some parrots can, that's how I would rule on that. Um, also, I wanted to see, and uh, so there's something similar in Starfinder. Um, there's a spell called Token Spell. Mm. Oh, or you could create... Ribbon says, or you could create dramatic effects while you monologue. You finish, Kinley finishes telling their joke. Cricket, cricket, cricket. Um, so, I actually took this when I played in Matt's game as Kai. Uh, token spells are often some of the first minor changes that spellcasters produce when they begin experimenting with magic. Once cast, token spells enable you to perform simple magical effects for one hour. The effects are minor and have severe limitations. You can slowly lift one item of light bulk. You can alter items in a one-foot cube each round, coloring, cleaning, soiling, cooling, warming, or flavoring them. You can create small objects, but they look artificial and are extremely fragile. You can illuminate an object to shed dim light in a 30-foot radius. Token spell in Starfinder is like a number of 5e cantrips. Yeah. It's a bunch of them rolled all up into one. I'm trying to find... Ghost sound. There is a horrifying spe spell in Starfinder called ghost sound. Um, you create a volume of sound that rises, falls, recedes, approaches, or remains fixed. You choose what type of sound this spell creates when casting it and cannot alter it thereafter. The, s the volume of sound created can produce as much noise as 20 normal humans. Thus, you can create shouting, singing, talking, marching, running, or walking sounds, as well as the sounds of battle or explosions. You can make noises that sound like machines, the general chatter of distant conversation, or the roar of an alien predator, but you can't make specific sounds such as intelligible speech or the exact hum of a particular starship's engines. So I took illusion, I took ghost sound for Kai because I wanted them to be creepy. And literally at any point, they can just, with their creepy white smile, open their mouth and 20 human voices scream. Yikes. And the range of that, David, is 25 feet plus five feet for every two levels. What level were you? By the end, I think we were eight. So that's an additional, so that's 45 feet. That's so much. Yeah. Like, yeah, I would try to set you on fire. Like immediately. Someone tried that. Yeah, that, that was tried. I'd be like, okay, listen, I, I, all this, I want none of this. So apply fire until problem solved. Yes. What's your next one, David? 
friends. Friends? For the duration, you have advantage on all charisma checks directed at one creature of your choice that isn't hostile towards you. When the spell ends, the creature realizes that you used magic to influence its mood and becomes hostile towards you. A creature prone to violence might attack you. Another creature might seek retribution in other ways, at the DM's discretion, depending on the nature of your interaction with it. Now, knowing that you have a limited time, to get what you need to get, like like you you, you load this up when you got some inspiration backed away, packed away, um, and you got sixty seconds to get all the answers that you can before they realize what's up. But and, and like you know, on the one hand, you know, you think to yourself, okay, this is fine, um, you know, you could use this to interrogate people, and it, in our home game. Our, our, our sorceress is standing outside of a warehouse where bad things are happening in the warehouse and we need to get in. And there are multiple guards. And she's by herself. Other people are showing up. And she's like, listen, we're going to have to fight all these people. But this guy, this guy right here, He's 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 not gonna have, and so she's just just chatting with this guy, gets all the information she needs out of him, and keeps him occupied long enough for the rogue to walk up behind him and be like, "Huh, those are some nice kidneys you got there. It'd be a shame if they got stabbed by a dagger." Which, brilliant, just. She used the friend's spell to delay the start of combat until reinforcements arrived, which is just a brilliant use of the spell. But in addition to that, she fired it up later at a masquerade ball while talking to essentially the lieutenant of an extremely dangerous person who was extremely dangerous as is. I was like, listen, you're giving me the runaround. I need answers. And I also need time to get away. And so she fires up friends. She gets some, some answers. And then she drops it. And he's like, I see you. I see. You. So, so yeah. So, like, friends, when, when you're using it with a guard or other people who are, quote, unquote, prone to violence, you could use that to time when combat starts. Mm. And everybody who's done enough combat in 5e, everyone who's played Baldur's Gate knows that the most potent advantage you have is action economy. So, like, I mean, that it's, it's why they build layer actions and legendary actions into big bosses to compensate for the massive advantage that action economy gives you. So when you can set up a fight the way you want it mm -hmm. and or start a fight when you want it, like, imagine having 60 seconds for your bard to put bless on everyone. Um, for your, your wizard to cast mage armor. Um, for all sorts of other thing like buff spells to go off and then you drop friends and then combat starts um and it makes for like listen the most exciting part well no there are many exciting parts of the masquerade because a whole lot of shenanigans happened there but the most exciting part of that for me was when she went to this dude who worked for the batter dude who was a bad dude himself and the, the friend spell dropped and a big smile came up on his face and he was like mm. and she was like uh oh I gotta go <laughs> yep and there's a there is a similar spell that we used yeah I play on the emergency power podcast and if you haven't listened to season 3 yet you should it's really fun it's complete now um, but 
we had two characters who had it's not friends it's not exactly the same but yeah we kind of brute forced that on a character that we really needed information from and you know i kind of forgot a little part of the spell and it was fine because we'd already gotten what we needed out of the person um so do keep in mind with things like friends with those kinds of spells we had so my character I have Hypnotic Glow, which is a class feature of one of mine, of Soul. And uh, if I, I can, I get like 60 seconds where they do what I want, right? And I can have them do what I want. If I am out of sight and they are not doing something unusual, something against their normal will, they won't remember they've been controlled. Whereas another one, uh, that's available in Starfinder. An another similar spell. Oh, one second. Um, another similar spell is uh, that costs a spell slot because mine's just a class feature because I'm special. It lasts for hours. And like they get something like eight hours of charm. And we had this character and we're like, hey, you get us where we need to go. Give us the info we need. Cool. Go go live your life, right? You're you're fine. We don't have a grudge against you personally. And that character was going to just take off and go on her happy way until my character's like, actually, you might be useful. Talk to my friend. And by the way, if you even think about betraying him, I will hunt you down and kill you. Because that's my character. Yeah, that spell breaks when you threaten them. Ooh. Now, it was fine because... Her, yeah. and we'd gotten everything, but it was like, yeah, I forgot about that, didn't I? Good job, self. Good job, good job, self. Mm. It's a good thing we, but there's a reason I waited until we were parting ways. So, yes, remember, you know, don't, don't, I think to some of them, I think there's a couple where if they, if you attack the ally of the person charmed, it breaks it too. So it's like, just stop fighting. Just stop. I, there's too many versions of this across too many things, but there's a couple where it's like, we're going to stop fighting for 30, for a minute. You get, you get 60 seconds to like heal, buff, prepare, hold actions, but no one's hitting anyone for 60 seconds or else this fight's going to start again without our permission. So, speaking of things that we're going to talk about, even though we sh really shouldn't talk about yet, but we're going to talk about it anyway. Because sooner or later, y'all are going to find out about it. And you're going to have a moment of, oh, this is what they were talking about. We need to talk, David, about the cr most creative use I have seen of Levitate. Yes. Okay, for, for those watching at home, Levitate. One creature or object of your choice that you can see within range rises vertically up to 20 feet and remains suspended there for the duration. The spell can levitate a target that weighs up to 500 pounds. Any unwilling creature that succeeds on a constitution saving throw is unaffected. The target can move only by pushing or pulling against a fixed object or surface within reach, such as a wall or ceiling, which allows it to move as if it were climbing. You can change the target's altitude by up to 20 feet in either direction on your turn. If you are the target, you can move up or down as part of your move. Otherwise, you could use your action to move the target, which must, must remain within the spell's range. When the spell ends, the target floats gently to the ground, if it is still aloft. So, number one, I was playing in a game with Wild Magic. And one of the party members got hit with Levitate, and so it was just floating. So we got to do a fun little, we now have a party member who's a balloon. We just took their hand and dragged them because that's part of the thing of levitate is you are literally that you can't move it's not fly it's zero g. you are just yeah you were zero g and you can do this all you want but unless you can actually grab something i had a mofo in a fight with melee monsters run up to one of the melee monsters put his hand on melee monster cast levitate and then ran the heck away and we had one harmless floaty boy. Yep. Just floating. It's like just just don't go near that one. Right? It's like the it's like the 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 serial killer under house arrest. Don't go to that house. If you don't go to that house, 
you're fine. It was incredible. I I need to come up with a uh, some sort of asshole wizard because I could just see like you go into you go to interrogate somebody, walk up, pat them on the back, they're floating, and then you sit in a chair and you just throw stuff at them, and it's like, listen, you're here for ten minutes, mm. so you can tell us what you want and gently to the ground or we could just actually does that okay so if you're floating could you like turn someone upside down and just waterboard them just yeah. be like because yeah. water doesn't count as ground right or nope and uh, um you can change their orientation every six seconds so yeah you could six seconds in six seconds I didn't even think about waterboarding. <laughs> I just, I started rewatching um, The Umbrella Academy. Waterboarding is normally not on my mind, but I watched Robert Sheehan get waterboarded recently. So I mean, let, let's be real. You think about It's a thing you would like. Every day. Um, <laughs> David does not like Robert Sheehan. <laughs> oh, poof, listen. You know that that's like what Kinley would look like. I hate to say it, Kinley's fight on sight. <laughs> Getting all the smoke. Just like, yeah, I catch you out in the streets. I mean, he's not as bad as any of Robert's characters, but that's what he looks like. Ooh, I, I, it would trigger my PTSD so much because that dude is just out there playing himself. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so like, what other. Okay, da conditions. Developer Damien said, Boots of Levitation and an oar got me through a pinch to cross an underground lake in my first campaign. That's cool. Very cool. Um, would that count as paralysis? Like, so, so I, I looked up the, the list of conditions. Mm -hmm. And it's like petrified, poisoned, prone, restrained, um, stunned. I guess it would count as restrained. Creature speed becomes zero. Um, well, their their speed against... doesn't become zero. They just have to like they have a they basically have to use a climb speed. Right. But if you don't give them anything to hey, climb. Chris. And it says uh, attack rolls against the creature have disadvantage, and the creature's attack rolls have disadvantage. No, attack rolls against the creature have advantage, and the creature's attack rolls have disadvantage. The creature has disadvantage on dexterity saving throws. Yeah, so the question is, like, what, what condition is most applicable for levitate? Hmm. Because like, you know, it like, doesn't it doesn't say that if you're levitating, you have disadvantage on attacks. Right. But if you're floating at zero G. Like and you're like a barbarian. Yeah, if you hit something when you're levitated, I'd imagine you'd be pushed back. Right. You went, Whack! Again, this is one of those like. Dear Wizards of the Coast, you could you could give us. We have questions. Right. Um, Ribbonza wants to know if your wizard is capital A asshole wizard or just a wizard who is an asshole. I think the answer is yes. R right. Like. So, as as I'm thinking about this character. He's he he'll be someone that does the right thing for the wrong reasons, mm. and does the right thing in the like wrongest way possible. Like you know, you you come across a centaur that is chained to a fence. Centaur you don't counter. cut the the chain. You cut off the centaur leg and be like, "Look, you're free." <laughs> Um, 
I look in in some game. I have to put like a whole like centaur disability re like 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 <laughs> home for disabled centaurs, and then have a guy there that's just a hundred percent human, and he's like, I don't have the rest of my legs. This is a problem. It's like, has anybody ever told you that you're a human? He's like, I mm, can't can't believe any of that. <gasps> Uh, uh, in three, oh. yeah, in three point five, levitate gave a stacking penalty on attack rolls as the character becomes more unstable for momentum. It is hmm. weird that it's not in five e. I mean, five e was like, here's a bunch of the stuff. We're going to strip it down. Yeah. Uh, probably so you could allow more shenanigans. Because like, when the when the player was like. I'm going to reach in and I'm going to cast Levitate on this thing and it can try and resist it. And I'm like, yeah, it's going to try and resist it. And it didn't. Um, like this particular monster had like a, an AOE thing that it could have done that was annoying. Like it didn't do damage, but it was very annoying. And I was like, you know what? So distracted by being in zero G. This is not a monster that like could jump. So being in zero G is very strange for it. I'm like, you know, this is so clever. I, I want to reward this. So no, it's not going to do its it's not going to do its AOE thing because it's just more fun for it to just be sitting there spinning. Levitate in 3.5 is such a worse spell. Like, um, you can only move something up to 100 pounds. Oh, it's 100 pounds per level. Okay, so that's different. But it's, it's only one minute per level. Mm. And you can't do it against unwilling, unwilling creatures. And it's like, but then I can't cast it on things and waterboard them. All right. On the waterboarding note, which I did start. David, what's your next one? Can you cast Levitate on a tiny hut? Absolutely. <laughs> and you just have a floating shell. Well, that's how you make it a, a floating um, shield. Does it qualify as an object? Hold on. I'm, I'm double checking. Oh, no, it says it's immobile. It's an immobile dome of force. So you could cast it on it. It just wouldn't move. It's like it is levitating. Except. Just, not. just did. Um, so the next one I have is find familiar, which. We're having a player have some some fun with that said, find familiar is expensive. Yeah. I mean, look, being a wizard is really expensive anyway. Yeah, my a lot of wizard is going to be broke as hell. <laughs> it's like well, I have a lot of spell, games. Yeah, a lot of games ignore the cost that it takes to learn a spell, right? Because wizards have to buy magical parchment and magical ink, which are freaking expensive to transcribe it into their spell book. They then have to buy the material component. And a lot of games just ignore that. So wizards get OP really quick. But if you play rules as written, wow, it's hard to be a wizard. Yeah. Um, definitely next game I run, it's like, listen, you got to do the math on me. You got <gasps> to show me all your ducats and whatnot. Rex says, uh, I had a player who wanted to cast Tiny Hut on a ship. I pointed out that the ship would keep moving and the hut was fixed to the planet. So heck of a way to wreck a ship. Oh my oh, god. That I can weaponize this. Devastating. Can you imagine sneaking on board like an enemy submarine? Yeah. Casting tiny hut. I mean, you'd have to be in there still. That's the I guess if you have water walk prepared. Because if you're underwater and you cast water walk, you just shoot to the top. You wouldn't even have to be in it. You could just be in front of it. You have to be, if if the person who casts it leaves the dome, it stops existing. Right. But, like, if you're standing in front of where, like, a submarine or a ship or wherever is going. Oh, right. Yeah. 30 feet. If you could, I guess, would you have to see in? It doesn't specify line of sight. It's a ritual. But, yeah. But yeah. Wizard is a class for the rich. It is definitely. What would win? <laughs> Devastating engine of war or one tiny hut? Good, good. Super fair. Damien in here asking the important questions. Right. 
But yeah, next next game I run, it's like, listen, you want to be a wizard? This is how much money you have. Uh, but you break out the abacus because you're going to be doing some math. I will never play a wizard in a David game. <laughs> I would I would double the math just for you. For those of you who don't know, Kay does not math. Kay is an English major. Kay is dyslexic as fuck. Math is not the friend. I'd be like, listen, I understand that you did this in GP, but now you have to do the conversion. <laughs> and you have to go check the market rate <laughs> of the curve. Oh. I, okay. I would be terrified. But we're talking about Find Familiar. Find Familiar. You gain the service of a familiar, a spirit that takes an animal form you choose. Bat, cat, um, crab. I was I was about to do just like a bunch of like like rhyming words, but I stopped myself. Be like bat, cat, rat, hat, <laughs> chat. I was about to do this, but I stopped myself, and now I'm gonna do it. Right. Because I just told you that I was gonna do it. Right. Bat, cat, crab, frog, toad, hawk, lizard, octopus, owl, poisonous snake, fish, quipper. I am not nautical enough to know what a quipper is. Um, rat, raven, seahorse, spider, or weasel. I mean, I don't oh need magic God. to be a weasel. Oh my god, a coupon clipping wizard is my new favorite thing. <laughs> Thank you, Ribbon Anza. Yeah, just just broke it, Dusty. <laughs> just has like the little notebook of like, okay, otter spleens are this much over here. Okay. <laughs> right. It's like, listen, I'm gonna need to see the weekly ad for what you got in here. <laughs> and here's the thing about Find Familiar is like, anytime if you're like, cool, I have my I have my cat. Uh, we need something with the fly speed. You have to recast it. And you have to burn all that cost to recast it. Read the read the read the material components on that, David. Material components: ten GP worth of charcoal, incense, incense, and herbs that must be consumed by fire in a brass brazier. Now, to torment K, and also to avoid doing the regular like copper, silver, gold thing, to make my world feel more alive. I came up with multiple currencies, and Kay, you haven't run into currencies from other countries. You're welcome. You're welcome. Because I had market rate conversions, and I had market rate conversions for after certain events in the game happened, where one currency would get stronger compared to every, and others would get. Listen, I I went too deep. Okay. Why do you hate me and yourself? <laughs> Because I don't like doing math either. I don't like doing math, so I'm going to do a shit ton of math to make my players do more math. <laughs> you monster. What? You self-hating monster. <laughs> right? You masochistic sadist. Look, a Pyrrhic victory is still a victory. <laughs> um, but, so I did, I did, I was doing the math. And one GP is the equivalent of about $250 US right now. Or at least like you went too deep. Let me just you went yeah. too deep. So imagine casting a spell for $2,500. Like that is the real world value of. That, of look. I know people who have paid more than that to, to get their breeder specific perfect kitty and or puppy. I've known people who've spent that much to take their um, been hit by a car near roadkill dog to the vet to get them looked at. Um, but your familiar acts independently of you, but it always obeys your commands. So it's not a cat. In combat, it rolls its own initiative and acts on its own turn. A familiar can't attack, so not a combat spell, but it can take other actions as normal. When the familiar drops to zero hit points, it disappears, leaving behind no physical form. It reappears after you cast this spell again. Yikes. Also, the punctuation on this is terrible. 
While your familiar is within 100 feet of you, you can communicate with it telepathically. Additionally, as an action, you can see through your familiar's eyes and hear what it hears until the start of your next turn, gaining the benefits of any special senses that the familiar has. During this time, you are deaf and blind with regard to your own senses. As an action, you can temporarily dismiss your familiar. It disappears into a pocket dimension where it awaits your summons. Alternatively, you can dismiss it forever and blow 2,500 bucks. <laughs> As an action, while it is temporarily dismissed, you can cause it to reappear in any occupied space within 30 feet of you. You can't have more than one familiar at a time. If you cast the spell while you already have a familiar, you would instead cause it to adopt a new form. Choose one of the forms from the above list. Your familiar transforms. Finally, when you cast a spell with a range of touch, your familiar can deliver the spell as if it had cast the spell. Your familiar must be within 100 feet of you, and it must use its reaction to deliver the spell when you cast it. If you if your spell requires an attack roll, you use your attack modifier for the roll. Do, do, do. So, before we go down this rabbit hole, I have to share with you all the official artwork of my favorite... Look, I love me a frumpkin. Don't get me wrong, I love me a frumpkin. But let me introduce you to the doctrine of Boggy the Froggy. And David, I'm putting this in our chat so you can easily see it too. Boggy the Froggy is from Dimension 20. And he is perfect. Kinley would hate him, but he is perfect. The collar is where it's supposed to be, however. He is perfectly round. Magic is real, and so is my frog, yes. And, um, oh goodness, well that, that was definitely a bad, but let's see if I can find. Here is what you need to know. Okay, that is, that is better, hold on. Here is also what you need to know about Boggy the Froggy. He comes in a back view. Someone spent too much time on this. Frogs have the tiniest butts ever. Tyran, thank you so much for the resub. 10 months? That's almost a wow. year, sir. I cannot believe. Thank you all. Um, but yes, familiars are wonderful. The help action, oh my goodness. Uh, the other the other familiar that I absolutely love is Sprinkle from A Crown of Candy. And Sprinkle is the familiar of a gummy bear knight. And it is literally a Sprinkle. And... Brennan Lee Mulligan plays the familiar, so like a lot of people allow, like I usually let people play their familiar because I'm like, this is your familiar. Brennan Lee Mulligan plays the familiar. And so like the gummy bear knight will be like, Sprinkle, can you do this? It'll go, oh, oh, oh. And that is the sound that a sentient That's Sprinkle right. makes. Sprinkle is amazing. I love Sprinkle. Um, Boggy the Froggy, ridiculous. Sprinkle, wonderful. I threw my tablet pin. Continue with what you were saying, David, now that I have derailed on my favorite familiars. Level two spell. Dragon's Breath. This is the wrong spell, too. Yeah. So, so I, I got hung up on the fact that the familiar and find familiar can cast touch spells. So I was like, what touch spells are they? And most of them are pretty innocuous. But then there is the... Is it first level? First level, inflict wounds. Oh, inflict wounds is me. Like, in inflict wounds, I um, at least a, a clerics that I play get it. And no one is prepared for a cleric to do that amount of freaking damage. It now look, most people... D10. 30. Most, most people are not... Most people underestimate clerics. The amount of damage that a cleric can do is ridiculous. They are more than just heal bots. Respect your cleric, especially your grave domain. They're terrifying. They are terrifying, and they will cancel your crit if you give them shit. 
whenever I get around to acquiring and playing Baldur's Gate 3, you better believe I'm I'm bipping up a cleric because them motherfuckers could hit like a truck. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Kesla as a cleric would be hilarious. Just saying. I'm trying to think of like lore wise. They got derailed. He got derailed on his quest because he wanted to be he wanted to deal with them teeth and everyone trusts cleric. Cleric's True. heal. You Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mm -hmm. Now now I'm looking but, now, I'm, now I'm looking up all the different domains for for Well, that is Yeah. But Kessler is a grave domain cleric makes way too much sense to me, I'm just saying. Uh, playing Baldur's Gate 3, I've never had problems running out of spells except for my clerics. They're so versatile. Yes, clerics are ridiculously versatile. And my creepy plant domain, uh, plant vegetation genasi is a grave domain cleric. So the amount of versatility that they have, just re a teeth domain cleric is a dentist. Imagine like an enamel spell where you just raise someone's AC. I was going to say, imagine an enamel spell where you take it from someone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that would hurt like the tickets. <laughs> That's your version of inflict wounds. You just yeah. like, give me the David's rogue is, is a creeper and has an obsession with teeth. Um, yes. If anyone is wondering why this strange conversation is happening, but and, and find familiar. Before, before, listen. It's listen. like, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. so I haven't watched, I haven't sat down and watched Dimension Twenty, but um, uh, okay, I'm gonna make a tooth fairy demigod. What? <laughs> make a note of that right now. Um, but. What was the creepy kids 3D movie with the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy? Because you do Jack Frost. You do not need to see that, but you absolutely need to see that because Thanks. it is going to give you ideas. Noted. Um, but so Warlock patron is the Tooth Fairy. Right. Um, I haven't watched the, the whole show, but I have seen clips of Hank Green playing Dimension 20 with Brendan Lee Mulligan. And the way Hank Green delivers science facts in the most menacing way possible. He didn't. What's funny is he didn't start out doing it. He just started doing fat. And Brennan's like. <laughs> so in this season of Dimension 20, um, they are. It's Mint This is Mintopolis that we're referencing, which is actually not D and D at all. It is um, a, a a conversion of Kids on Bikes, so it's very rules light. Uh, yes, the fix is absolutely incredible. And here's the thing, David. Brennan Lee Mulligan also loves animal facts, especially bird facts, but animal facts in general. So this is a thousand percent up. Brennan's alley. Like, this is Hank Green singing the siren song to Brennan. And he just started, like, he was like, because he plays the, uh, the fix, which is hyperfixation. Uh, so they're all aspects of one person's mind. So That's everyone great. is a different part of one character's brain. That's pretty cool. It's really cool. Um, there's a whole mystery in involving what's happening on the outside world because not everyone has all the information. They react at the speed of thought, whereas time in the real world is much slower. So everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. One of the players is the conscience. But like Fix was just trying to like, like hyperfixation, right? Like we focus, we clear away. I need you to focus on this. I'm going to tell you, did you know that, um, uh, was it pelicans? I think it was pelicans. Do you know that pelicans have three stomachs, one specifically for bones? So, I need you to tell me about this. And Bernie Lemel is like, <laughs> he just stops existing. He just explodes. <laughs> like, this thing just stops existing. And then Hank, like, figured it out and dialed it up from there. But it was so accidental is what makes it so great. Is he didn't come in going, like, I'm going to be scared. Because if he did come in and try to be scary, it wouldn't have been as good. It's just he's all like, here's a weird, freaky animal fact. And Brendan's like, oh, we're doing animal facts? You're doing animal facts to me? so wholesome. 
fun. This is gonna be so great. <laughs> and then he hits him with just the. I menace. won't. No, I. I won't. I won't say what ends up happening. Like it's the series is not over. But there's the cutest moment between the two of them, and that's all I've got. Continue. But with because Hank Green taught me the way of the science fact menace. My 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 rogue is styles himself as the apothecary. He is a rogue, could do rogue stuff, but mostly goes around treating people's teeth. And just the 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 combination of sheer amount of anatomy stuff that I know plus the fact that this guy is creepy as hell is going to be an absolute nightmare for everyone else. I'm going to put this in your brain and it's going to be terrible because I'm going to make you go back to the Find Familiar spell after this, but I just read a fun fact that apparently humans used to have a third set of teeth and we might be able to have chemicals to make it regrow. Now, Find Familiar. I wish my dentist had a higher <laughs> sleight of hand. That hurts my heart, my soul, right. and my spine, Rex. Right. If it makes you feel any better, every, like, lock pick and sleight of hand roll I've made so far has failed. Every single one. Yeah, I fun. love how outraged Kesla is about everything that doesn't work. Yeah, that hurts my gums. Yeah, good, good. Mm. Okay, find familiar. So, so yeah, so I went down the, the whole rabbit hole of, like, it's a touch spell. Or you can cast touch spells with your familiar. And so it's just like, you make a rat, and then you sneak the rat into a guard's barracks, and then you cast inflict wounds on anyone under, like, level five. Dead. Yeah, and, and just, just Don't even roll damage. is gonna just... boil. It's just over. Like, like, imagine, imagine... Ooh. <laughs> oh no wizard college one of the wizards is up to no good and is assassinating students or teachers or when rat goes in a room because like a level one wizard has like a, a <coughs> number of hit points like like you get you get a cough's worth you, you get a pig squeals worth of hit points. It's like Hank Green couldn't even get to his animal facts because he'd do like, at one point he was like, I'm going to, I flick him on the forehead and I throw some animal facts and he actually did them. And he's like, and then I ask him the question. I'm like, you wouldn't even get the animal facts. You'd flick him once and the, the level one wizard's dead. And so, and it's, it's what, a level one spell? I think it's level two. Checking. Um, Double check me. 5e. I thought you had it open still. Right, so. that's 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 a level one. It's level ne one. Ooh. How many? How <laughs> but many expensive. Expensive. Components. Find familiar? No, no, no. Inflict wounds. Oh yeah, but you'd need the familiar to do it. Right. The way you're saying. But you know, you you you, you get together your twenty five hundred bucks, slap that down. And then you have a familiar until it either dies or you dismiss it. Yeah. So you run it, you run it into somebody's room while they're sleeping, inflict wounds, they die a horrible death. No, and then you immediately dismiss it. No one knows it was you. And yeah, and it's it's like how many level one spell slots? Like like five? Too many? That means you could assassinate if, like four if or someone... five people every day. Yeah, if inflict wounds on a level one, would they die before they could even scream? Yeah. If it's enough damage where, where it kills you outright, then yeah, you don't scream. You don't even get a good old death rattle. You're just done. It's rough. It's rough, buddy. Just, just, but okay. it's, a, it's a level one spell. That's so, I gotta roll a cleric like tomorrow. <laughs> Clerics Yikes. are terrifying. Everyone underestimates the cleric. Like, I don't like playing healing class, but I love playing clerics because I will heal you. But not if you piss me off. And 
And yeah, so like just like a whole murder mystery of like who's the killer and how are they doing it? It's it's Mr. Buttersworth. No, it's Mr. Peanut Butter with the familiar in the library. I'm sorry, Mr. Peanut Butter has never been in a library in his life. True. And also, I would not trust Mr. Peanut Butter to sit still long enough to learn how to cast spells. Yeah, that's also the problem. I would set Mr. But Peanut Butter on fire. My my good friend Pan, aka Stellar Encore, replied to our tweet. He is uh, in. They are in the UK, so they are not awake right now. However, she replied to our thing with one of their favorite spells and i went you know what yes we need to we need to pull this up it's a second level transmutation spell called enlarge reduce i almost broke a game with this spell because uh not me checking tyran's character sheet to see if his <laughs> cleric has inflicted Rex. wounds <laughs> oh rex um so, Enlarge Reduce can be incredibly fun. How did my... I don't remember how my Artificer got this, but my Artificer had this. And we were in a game where we were all animals. We were all little animals, and there was a kitten, and it was a small kitten, and small kitten was in a, it was in a cage. And I'm like, what's, what's the size of the diamonds on the cage? And they're like, too small for kitten to get out of. And I'm like, but what's the size? And they're like, look at your kitten. Look at Gilmore. Can, do you think Gilmore can fit through? And I'm like, no, yeah. Gilmore can't right now. No. But if I cast reduce. Yep. So in large reduce, you cause a creature or object you see within range to grow larger or smaller for the duration. You either uh, choose either a creature or an object that is neither worn nor carried kind of sucks if someone's holding the big goyle. You can't make the big goyle even bigger to crush them. Uh, yep, enlarge reduces on the artificer spell list. Okay, cool. This is just an outdated thing. Um, David will be our B. Um, if the target is unwilling, it can make a constitution saving throw. On success, uh, the spell has no effect. The target is a creature. Everything it is wearing and carrying changes size with it. Any item dropped by an affected creature returns to normal size at once. For the enlarge, the creature's size doubles in all dimensions, and its weight is multiplied by eight. This growth increases its size by one size category, from medium to large, for example. There isn't enough room for the target to double its size. The creature or object attains maximum possible size in the space available. Until the spell ends, the target has advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws. The target's weapon also grows in size to match. While its weapon is enlarged, the targets attack with them, deal 1d4 extra damage. So, that's a combat side of it. Um, I will say another thing as soon as David gets back, because I want him here for it. Uh, reduce! The target size is halved in all dimension, and its weight is reduced to one-eighth of normal. This reduction decreases its size by one category from medium to small, for example. Until the spell ends, the target has disadvantage on strength checks and strength saving throws. The target's weapon also shrinks to match the size, and it deals 1d4 less damage. Can't be reduced it before one. David, if you enlarge a creature, it goes from, say, medium to large, um, and its weight is increased by eightfold. So you could turn a centaur into a weapon of mass destruction. I was waiting for you to come back so I could make the centaur reference. <laughs> so we have, we have established in a long running, long running joke on this channel. It's not even a joke at this point. It's just a talking point. The centaurs are a medium creature. And they weigh about the same as a human. Probably a little more. However... Didn't we do the math on what a centaur weighed? I don't do math, so no, I did not. We sure. did not. You might have. Rex might have. I know Rex has. Rex also has strong opinions about centaurs. But it only goes from medium to large. 
but its weight goes up by eightfold. Yeah, so... Wait, that doesn't seem right. Oh yeah, we did a whole thing because could it ride on a draft horse? Would right. we need a draft horse to ride it? And it was, yeah, so 750 to 1,200 pounds. Eight times 1,200 is a whole lot of animal. Well, that was also, um, we more than doubled the count in like 10 seconds. Yeah, well, this is the other fun weaponized use of enlarge. Is, you know, there's a whole thing about if you take a bunch of spell, if you take a, if you take a druid and cast fly on them, and the druid flies up above an armada of ships, and then uses summon creature, they can summon, I think, half a dozen cows. Yeah. And they can summon them a range okay. above them. So... I think without an ec without a boost to the spell, I don't think someone did all this math. I don't think it can hit terminal yep. velocity. But if you summon six cows and then cast enlarge on them, you could sink ships. Yeah, the you, the you weight could... of a cow times eight. How much? All right, cows Google, weigh don't a fare lot. me down. Square How cube law applies to size just for that spell. Cows weigh. 2,400 pounds. And what does the calculator say? N 19,200 pounds. Okay, cast I gotta figure out how fall damage. So works. I think someone said you can cast Insect Swarm and then polymorph the bugs into elephants, but I believe that the 5e folks did come back and say you can't do that because Insect Swarm doesn't technically create like individual insects i believe chris perkins came back and said nah on that one Nineteen thousand two hundred pounds is about the weight of a modern garbage truck you can just drop a garbage truck on a ship each in each cow well okay you can only enlarge reduce one one creature per casting so you'd have to very quickly cast or have multiple people who have enlarge reduce fair but it's only a second level spell yeah there i gotta look i gotta, I gotta do there's 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 some theory crafting that needs to happen here <laughs> because rules is written um it's only like it, like the height matters but not the size of the object mm. and also the damage that the cow would receive not the damage that the cow oh. would do damage would cat would be dead yeah the cow would be it would be, it would be unfortunate but yes but, there yeah, are... I gotta figure out like because if you get a cow up there and then you hit it with enlarge and 1900 pounds no, no I'm sorry 19,000 pounds worth of 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 a flying Bovine. meat <laughs> comes, yeah, that would sink. That would sink a battleship because, like, at and that overkill. level of ballistics, yeah, it would be, it, it, yeah, it. Especially if you get it high enough where it hits terminal velocity, right? But it wouldn't even need to hit, like, even it wouldn't, but. If it was going 60 miles an hour, because I know human uh, terminal velocity is 121 miles an hour. So if it did half of human terminal velocity, imagine being hit by a garbage truck <laughs> going 60 miles an hour. It's not going to end well. That's more That's more than 1d6 damage, okay? It's a little, it's a little bit more. But yes, if you have a small creature in your party and you need to be sneaky, hit them with a the reduce and let them run around as a tiny creature. The Technically, rules is, is written. It doesn't say anything about increasing your stealth, but come on. Come on. If you if you real small. Hey, Leslie, welcome on in. Doubles in all dimensions.
Hello, World War II nerd here. Most of the artillery shells that Battleship used were only around 2,000 pounds tops. It would sink any ship easily, says Tyran. Thank you, Tyran. Yo. Y ooh. Now, D&D PETA would become an after you, and for good reason. Yeah, fair. Fair. Like, you, you, you go in directly to hell for that. <laughs> But there have to be other things that you could summon besides living creatures. Oh yeah. That are that 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 you could that, that are cow sized. That you could then make bigger. Yeah, because like people people will understand that like ballistic rounds, like ballistic ammunition, doesn't have an explosive component. It's just metal that's going real fast. Uh, Damien says, now you just need to have the centaur wear plate armor and a cannon so that it could fire an enlarged one. I mean, you could do that with a trebuchet. Yeah. Let's see. We'd have to find some way to mitigate the damage that the centaur received. So uh, that Barbarian. Could... Right. Because they take half damage. And then I, you could probably do some kind of protection spell on top of that. Summon large diamonds, then enlarge to make even larger diamonds. And then you could you could have a tactical projectile centaur. Summon the iron golems. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Rex. Rex has done it. Do, do, do. Yeah, summon construct. Uh, you call forth the spirit of a construct and manifest in an unoccupied space that you can see within range. Um, when you cast a spell, choose the a material, clay, metal, or stone. So we got metal. Does it say how much that mofo weighs? Um, TPC, tactile projectile centaur, now banned in the Geneva Conventions. <laughs> no one wants what I bring to the siege table, says Rex. <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, 40 HP plus 15 damage. Ba, ba, ba. It doesn't say anything about, like, size. I'm going to have to look this up in more detail. Because, like, it's a it's a golem. It got to be pretty. It's a construct. It got to be pretty big. Oh, I mean, it doesn't medium. even have to be that big to be dense, you know? Yeah, so it's medium. But it's made out of stone. So like you take a-, a No, a, we're summoning a metal one. So you get a five foot humanoid sized chunk of metal. It doesn't specify. It says you could pick the material. Yeah, but it doesn't specify what type of metal. Because, okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, chemistry list of metals because oh, you can God. get heavier like more asshole metals yeah that's what I thought like uh, um, what's it called uh, 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 I mean gold weighs a ton but you definitely hurt your poor new friend not necessarily well I mean gold is very malleable carbide is what Rex says but Californium, okay, pl so plutonium is a, plutonium and uranium, right, metals. And they're radioactive to... Right. That's a war crime, David. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a war crime the first time. <laughs> <laughs> David huh. with his inflict ruined rats and his radioactive constructs that are in large reduce dropped onto a battleship. <laughs> so even yeah, if everyone doesn't die when the sink crashes, they've been exposed to radiation. <laughs> right. I was thinking lead, but uranium is so much worse. As to <laughs> can't write a war crime law if there are no witnesses. <laughs> right. This is why David and I don't play. Like, we run D&D &D together. We're not allowed to play D&D &D together. So, 
you 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 cat you you summon the construct and then you get that motherfucker in the air you trebuchet him over a wall and while he's up no, there no you have whoever does the summoning gets hit with a fly spell they fly above it they cast it the summoning up Ooh. higher yeah and then immediately yeah. hit it with enlarge reduce they fly up as far as they can above the battleship and they cast it, they cast summon farther up, then hit it with enlarge reduce as it goes down. Now, as soon as they cast the spell, they lose the fly. So someone else has to be ready to either catch them or use a feather fall. Um, let's see, at 121 miles an hour, that is... Okay, so fly. Target Pan, I hope speed. you watch this VOD and see what you've started. <laughs> I'm so proud. Duration concentration up to 10 minutes. Uh, uh, 60 feet per se. So it's 10 feet a second. So it's 600 feet in the air. It I'd starts to... falling. Enlarge Reduce has a 30 foot range. So they'd cast it higher, it would have to fall 30 feet before it can cast in large reduce again. Right, but so you cast, cast you cast fly on yourself, you fly up there. Oh, actually, no, you're right. Like, um, you wouldn't cast it on yourself. Someone else would cast fly on you. Well, it doesn't matter, because I believe the way fly works is as soon as... No, maybe that's invisibility. Does fly break when you cast a spell? Nope. Okay. Never mind. Yeah, someone else casts it then. I get sometimes I do like fly and invisibility. I'm like these two should have the same rules. They don't. I do. I do hate math, but look. So someone else casts fly on you. You get ten minutes. <clears throat> um, you can't fly the whole six hundred feet up because then you'd be six hundred feet up in the air. And it, it would, but. You get 500 feet in the air, and then you just come barreling back down. But even 300 feet in the air, you cast the golem above you, and then mm -hmm. you hit it with the enlarge, and then it lands and devastates the area. They would have abolished castle walls long before they actually did if wizards were kicking around yeah it depends on how much you are willing to sacrifice for the cause and yes in large reduce is concentration but if i was thinking fly has the same rules in visibility which it does not which is you can cast a spell without breaking the fly so you don't need to be able to cast feather fall or another fly oh summon construct is is uh, uh... is it also concentration so you would do you got two people with fly so you got you one to summon the construct and one to enlarge it so you need one person doing f oh, is fly concentration okay so yeah so you need four casters can you i th think can't you do can you not i thought you could do more than one target if you upcast fly but i might be wrong that's why castle walls are still there. Too many wizards already died from being death touched right. by familiar rats. Fourth level or higher. So you need three. So you need mm -hmm. one person to cast fly on two people. They get up there. One person summons Golem. The other one hits them with the enlarge. Boom. War over. I'm, I'm not going to say what I just thought. Yeah. Yeah, it's done. That's devastating. <laughs> there are some things I don't say on stream but I could say to David because funny you'd rock um, so we I know I had um, um, wow I have just drawn such a blank today and that is no good I believe we had Mallory talking earlier about using Mage Hand yep. I'm sorry we had Moxie earlier talking about using Mage Hand to set off all the traps um talked about some very clever does anyone else in chat have any other because we, we've been going for a while and it's about time to wrap up but does anyone else in chat still have have any um any other fun non-combat spells they want to make sure they hit dave we had a few more on our list but like i think we hit the really 
the really big good ones, unless one of y'all has just a really awesome clever use, because definitely there's some incredible uses of Dimension Door, but again, that's a higher level spell, and it wouldn't have have gotten Kesla out with his stolen goods. Someone decided to steal from a hag archfey. Yep. Who would do that? Have you done Tree Stride? If not, yes. So Tree Stride, <laughs> oh. Tree Stride is great. Unseen Servant is very fun for a prankster. Tree Stride, you gain the ability to enter a tree and move from inside it to inside another tree of the same kind within 500 feet. Both trees must be living and at least the same size as you. You must use five feet of movement to enter a tree you instantly know the location of all other trees of the same kind within 500 feet, and as part of the move used to enter the tree, can either pass into one of these trees or step out of the tree you are in. You appear in a spot of your choice within five feet of the destination tree, using another five feet of movement. If you have no movement left, the tree each... No, um, you appear within five feet of the tree you entered. You could use this transportation ability once per round for the duration. You must end each turn outside a tree. Concentration up to one minute. Yeah, uh, Tree Stride was the bane of Matt Mercer's existence in Campaign 2 because uh, these folks were just like, uh, not uh, Campaign 2, Campaign 1, uh, because Keyleth was just like, cool, we're walking through a tree now. We're going to go to this side of the world. That's like, great. Uh, Unseen Servant is incredibly fun. Uh, I I forget who told me this, and if it was if you're in chat, sorry, we hit knock earlier. Um, knock is an excellent one. We we figured out some shenanigans around that as well. Um, someone was saying that they their character was posing as a much more powerful magic user than they actually were when it was actually just their unseen servant running around and doing things. Which is hilarious. Uh, have have your unseen servant hold a sheet of paper and be a distracting ghost. Have it tap a rock rhythmically to make people pursue the wrong way. The rogue's greatest friend. Yes, unseen servants can be incredibly fun. I wonder if unseen servants can like pickpocket, or is that too complicated? I believe it's too tough. I mean, they could, but I I don't think they would be doing it sneakily. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, like, I believe if you have to roll a skill test, it's probably not good for an Unseen Servant. That's fair. But yes. Fair. Um, and with that, I do believe we are probably going to start wrapping things up here. Um, thank you all for hanging out with us and for helping us break and come up with very creative uses for non-combat spells, some of which become incredibly Control combat when focused. dealing with a caravan of wagons. Um, someone was talking about earlier, they used control wind to uh, move a ship. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite moments in Campaign 2 of Critical Role was Matt Mercer. They were on, they had a ship. They were going out on the high seas. They were being pursued. Mercer's got pages of ship combat custom rules written. He is ready to do a whole thing. And Caduceus, the cleric, walks up behind it and is like, I control water and have the wave capsize their boat. And Mercer's like, picks up the sheets of naval combat, shreds it, and is like, cool. <laughs> Let's go. You win. I <laughs> uh, cannot pickpock directly, pushing one side of a person to get their attention so you can pickpock yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, without saying too entirely much. Um, there is an entire subsection on AO3 dedicated to Mage Hand, Unseen Servant, and Find Familiar, where you are blind and deaf, but looking through the eyes of your familiar. <laughs> I did not need to know this. This is not something I needed to know today. Now you know. 
I know it now. You have to too. <laughs> that hurts. That hurts real bad. Things I know. For those of you who don't know, because some of y'all are newer here, I used to be the lead moderator for DeviantArt. <laughs> so there's a lot of things about the internet that I know that no one should. <laughs> so thank you for going on this journey with me. Because because your your familiar could be a spider. Well, we'll talk about this off camera. Um, is anyone, does anyone have suggestions on who we would like to raid today as we wrap up? Thank you all so much for hanging out with us. As always, I'm Kay. This is, I think this is the right way. This is David. Um, find me over on the initiative order tomorrow for oh, Chalice, yeah, where I am playing a horror game. Oh, octopus. Um, Thursday, I'm going to be here playing the Pokemon DLC. And Friday, if you all are able, we're going to be tweeting it soon. If you all are able to stop by or to retweet, like, or boost our um, tweet about our Friday game, our Friday stream in any way, it would be so appreciated. This is the first sponsored game stream, video game stream of this channel. Uh, we're going to be playing, David is going to be playing Telltale Games The Expanse. We are so excited. Very excited. Um, thank you so much to Telltale Games. So anything you can do to support or help boost would really actually mean a lot to us because we are a very small channel. And uh, we want to be able to do more things in the future. So that would be very appreciated. That's all the plugging we have today. Does anyone, has anyone, do, do, do. if you have a suggestion of who we should raid, uh, otherwise my friend Vana is playing Palia and that's oh, had perfect. some new updates today, new patches. They nerfed my pickled potatoes. However, they gave us spicy chili peppers, so I can grow chili peppers now. And that makes me very happy. JD says, and maybe they'll come by in the chat. They did a stream I was watching this weekend. Yes. Um, the person I know. Oh, cool. That's what we'll do. Uh, uh, the person I know at Telltale Games is in the UK time zone. So I don't think she'll be coming by because we're a little too late for her. But who knows? It will be Friday. Um, from afar. Our friends over at From Afar Podcast is playing Remnant, so we're going to go raid them. Say hi. That's David Tilstra, our good friend David Tilstra. So say hi to David. The raid uh, message is going to pop up here in just a moment. Thank you all for hanging with us. Be kind to yourself. Be excellent to others. And we will see you next time. Thank you again for being so amazing, chat.